In front of me is a book with over 120 photographs of Nazi soldiers in drag. Now recall, of course, that this was a regime that enforced its vision of gender normativity with a vengeance, and yet these soldiers were apparently not afraid to be photographed in drag, nor were any of the others around them who were all smiling, laughing, and having a good time. Almost every page bears one or more black and white snapshots from the war, whether in basic training, on furlough, or on the front lines. And the regalia of the Third Reich is unmistakable, and every one of them shows at least one soldier, sometimes whole groups of them, wearing skirts, dresses, headscarves, bras, coconut bras, or lingerie. None of these are professionally done photos. They're all candid shots from everyday soldiers, apparently chronicling what really went on in the common rank and file. So what are we to make of all this? Was the Nazi regime more diverse than we ever thought? Or are these soldiers just letting off steam with a game of dress-up? Or is there something more insidious lurking here? A policing of gender boundaries through the very act of crossing them? That's what we're talking about in today's Short Shorts episode. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. <laughs> History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. Hey folks, today we are going to be discussing certain photographs, which are of course visual, while this podcast is an audio medium. So I will describe them as best I can where relevant, but we will also post them for you to view in the episode post on our website, which you can find at www.historyofsexpod.com. All right, time for today's short shorts. Short, 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 short. Here's one at the dinner table. Four officers wine and dine casually while a fifth converses with them in a white dress and a ribbon in his hair. Here's another with a man in front of a grassy field, hands on his hips, a headscarf over his hair, and a bra on his chest. And here is yet another with a whole squad posing in uniform, one of them playing the accordion, and another wearing a shawl over bra and skirt. Now, I could keep going, but I think you get the idea. There's tons and tons of these photos here amassed from collectors, dealers, and the like. Almost none of them are annotated, so we have no idea who these people were or what the context was. Many of them are clearly theatrical in nature, but others, like the ones just mentioned, appear like they could very well be scenes of everyday life in the Wehrmacht, you know, the German army which did, by the way, mass confiscate tons of property, so it would have been no problem getting their hands on women's clothing even at the front. But the question is, why did they put it on? Martin Demon, the author of this book, asked the same question. When he began collecting war albums, he was struck by a particular trend that he found. In every 20 to 30 wartime albums, one will normally find one or two photographs of soldiers dressed up as women. Now that's a pretty high percentage, especially for a regime like the Third Reich, where non-normative gender or sexual performance could land you in a concentration camp, or worse. So what's the explanation for this? Well, before we answer that, let's get a clear understanding of what cross-dressing is. Cross-dressing refers to the act of wearing apparel typically associated with the opposite sex. It is the preferred term today, which supersedes the old term transvestite, which is now considered obsolete and possibly derogatory. And by the way, cross-dressing has no inherent connection to sexual orientation. Many cross-dressers are heterosexual, while others are homosexual or bisexual. There's just no connection there. And nor is cross-dressing necessarily connected to transgender identity. Transgender refers to those whose gender identity differs from that assigned at birth, whereas many cross-dressers have no such beef with their assigned gender. 
Now, in many cases for transgender people, the journey to full expression of their true gender identity may involve dressing in clothes opposite to their assigned sex. So being transgender and cross-dressing do often go hand in hand for many, but not for all. Another person might be perfectly comfortable with their assigned sex, yet gain sexual gratification by transgressing it with the clothing of the opposite sex, or what have you. In fact, reasons for cross-dressing can be quite varied, sometimes without any connection to sex or gender at all. One reason is for the theater, for example, such as in Shakespearean England, where only men were allowed to be actors, and so female roles required men to dress up as women. And another reason is disguise. In order to avoid detection, or sometimes to obtain entry into areas of society forbidden to your sex, you might put on the garb of the opposite sex. Many women over the ages have done so to join the army or to attend medical school, for example. And these types of cross-dressing are motivated more by the situation while revealing nothing particular about who a person is deep down. But what I want to focus on most today is that deep down aspect, cross-dressing that expresses something about who you are. It might be an expression of gender, or a realization of sexual desire, or another reason, but regardless, it says something about you as a person. I want to know, are any of the soldiers in Daman's photographs actually deep down cross-dressers in this sense? Or are they all just situationally motivated, you know, playing dress-up on a whim, or perhaps even to mock actual deep down cross-dressers? And how can we know? How can we tell the difference by looking at these photographs? Because, you know, gender performance is a particularly complex aspect of human behavior, and that's what interests me most today. Are these photos of theater, disguise, or identity? Or could they be all three at once? Many of the photos are clearly theatrical in nature. Sometimes you can even see the improvised stages, sets, and backdrops. And yet, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't some expression of identity going on as well. Just as the stage in Shakespearean England may have attracted those for whom cross-dressing expressed more than just a job, so theater in the German army may have sometimes attracted those who were doing more than just acting. See, the complicated messaging of theater allows a person to be both out in the open and concealed at the same time. You're out in front of everybody in the sense of being in women's clothing, and yet concealed in the sense that you can always fall back on the cover story that it's just theater, quote-unquote. And in societies that are hostile to cross-dressing, well, that can be crucial to a person's safety, while at the same time providing a rare outlet for authentic self-expression. Germany of the early 20th century was particularly rich with theatrical cross-dressing. First of all, there was a long tradition of it at carnival time. For example, in Cologne, the mascot of the carnival parade is the Virgin, quote-unquote, which, since the 1820s, has traditionally been played year after year by a man. But secondly, cross-dressers, that is, those for whom it expressed something deep down about who they were, had started to come out into the open during the early 20th century. The term transvestite had been coined in 1910 by Magnus Hirschfeld, and Hirschfeld also worked with legal authorities to issue passports of a sort, certificates that showed police that they wore opposite clothing as a matter of personal expression, not as a public nuisance, quote-unquote, which is what the police often harassed them for, assuming that they cross-dressed for the sake of prostitution. But these certificates stated, nope, not a prostitute, just who I am, thanks. It was that kind of forward progress which started almost for the first time in the early 20th century in Germany. Meanwhile, drag shows had become fashionable during the Weimar years as well. Cabaret shows often featured women in men's suits, top hats, and monocles. And that included, for example, the superstar Marlena Dietrich. Falling in love again, never wanted to, what I got to do, can't help it. Now, Marlena Dietrich 
was herself bisexual, and so it's possible that her performance in drag may have been more than just a job. It may have been an expression of how she felt about her gender or her sexuality. Although, as said before, it doesn't necessarily have to have a connection to those things, but it could have had for her. And yet, at the same time, the double messaging of the theater allowed Dietrich and others like her to say, here I am, this is me, while at the same time saying, it's all just masks and costumery, this is not me, and therefore leave the audience to work out the ambiguity for themselves. And in very much the same way, some of the soldiers in these photographs might be saying, here I am, at last you can see who I really am, while at the same time saying, now nah, we're just joking around. That's the kind of complicated double messaging that is often involved in this sort of thing in a society that is hostile to it. Now, in addition to the complicated messaging of theater, there is also the subterfuge of disguise that sometimes motivates cross-dressing. Now, it's probably not too likely that any of the soldiers in women's dress in these photos are actually women or something like that. I kind of doubt that any of these people are attempting to disguise their real identity. It's pretty clear they're men. But on the other hand, it is not impossible that some of the other soldiers, the ones in the background, the ones in regular men's clothing and uniforms and whatnot, it's possible that some of them could be in disguise. I mean, you might think that it would be virtually impossible to pull off hiding one's sex throughout a war, but in fact, many women across history have done so. So it is possible that someone here in this book could be doing it too. One photograph in particular does draw my eye in this regard. Again, go to our website to see what I'm talking about, but here it is. I'll describe it to you. It's a party scene focused on two dancing couples, and then there are others around them watching. The female partners in the dancing couples wear skirts with headscarves, but they are very clearly men. So that's what draws your eye initially. But then on second look, wait a minute, look at their partners, the ones that are in men's clothing. One of them is clearly a man, but the other one has an extremely girlish face now that you look at it. And it's possible that it's just a dude with a girlish face, but it could also be a dudette passing for a dude. Now, is that likely? Maybe not. But is it possible? Well, stranger things have happened. It would be a supreme irony if you have this whole book about men dressing up as women only to find out that the real story here is that there's this woman who's passing as a man. Because disguise was one of the motivations for cross-dressing, and it is at least possible that we are seeing that here. Now, the last motivation for cross-dressing is that deep-down one, where dressing as the opposite sex does say something about who you are. And we've already mentioned how some of these people in these photos could be expressing something deep down while at the same time maintaining that appearance of theater, or that it's all just dressing up just for fun. And honestly, most of these photos probably are just for fun, quote-unquote, although there's a second more insidious aspect of that that we'll get to in just a second. But for now, I just want to make the point that it is possible that at least some of these people are really expressing something internal to themselves. And if that's the case, then there's an even more interesting question to ask. Is it possible that any of these individuals in these photos were completely out in the open, even with their squad mates, about their true sense of gender or sexuality, wearing women's clothing as a statement of their identity. And in that case, did their squad mates accept them for who they were, happily posing right alongside them in these photos, all hunky-dory-like? Because after all, not everyone fell for the ideology of the regime. The Wehrmacht, or army, was far less indoctrinated or Nazified compared to more brainwashed branches like the SS. And moreover, there was a very recent tradition of tolerance toward alternative genders and sexualities, which would have been experienced firsthand by any soldier over the age of about 20 or so. They would have lived through that Weimar era. And finally, indoctrinated or not, bigoted or not, what really motivates a soldier in the end is not so much that ideology coming down from the top, but really loyalty to the soldier next to you, loyalty to your squad mates, the ones that are going to keep you alive. That's what really motivated soldiers during this war. 
You know, not every Nazi soldier was as racist or bigoted as Hollywood likes to depict. Many were just tipping a nod to the ideology while just trying to keep their head down and get through it. So yeah, maybe, maybe there were rare instances where Nazi or not, compassion and acceptance actually broke through and cross-dressers could be out in the open for real. And yet, the Third Reich was a place where this stuff could get you killed. And posing for photographs basically handed the evidence right over to your accusers. You know, it only takes one person to narc on you and then you're dead. So anyone who would take that kind of gamble would have to be a brave soul indeed. Maybe they felt that they were going to die anyway? I mean, it was war after all, and so why not? Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. At least you get to be authentic for once in your life before you go. So why not? So yeah, it's possible that at least some of these photographs of soldiers might show completely out in the open, no deception, no double messaging, cross-dressers with squad mates who accepted them. But few can muster that kind of courage, I can say that. So I guess call me cynical, but I doubt that that's what we're seeing here in the majority of these photos, if not all of them. More likely, in my opinion, is something much, much darker going on here. Now I mentioned before how the innocent game of dress-up might not be so innocent after all. And here is where we get to the insidious part. The policing of gender boundaries in any society, anywhere, even today, is a complicated thing that can condemn at the same time that it enacts the very thing that it condemns. Now, let me break that down for you by using an analogy. When I was in high school in the 90s, it was totally common for guys to call each other gay and even to put on a femi voice and mannerisms, but everyone knew that they didn't really think that they were gay. Rather, they were making fun of gays. It was a callous, insensitive mockery that made it clear to everyone around them that it was not okay to be gay. So it condemned the thing at the same time that it enacted it. That's what I mean by that. So you can't necessarily just look at the ones that are performing this gender transgression. You might have to look at the ones behind them. The ones in my high school calling each other gay weren't the gay ones. If you wanted to know who was really gay, it was probably the one that was acting totally straight, the kid in the corner. The play acting of a femi voice and mannerisms by straight guys reinforced the social boundary that kept those people in the corner, desperately hoping that attention didn't land on them. And in the same way, I suspect that a large percentage of these photographs actually show gender policing more than gender transgression. The game of dress up just for fun, quote unquote, actually highlighted the rigidity of gender boundaries by exposing the supposed absurdity of crossing them. These soldiers were in fact enforcing normative gender and sexuality by treating anything else as stuff only fit for laughter. Now is that to say that they just woke up one morning and said, hey, you know what'd be fun today? Let's police some gender boundaries. No, it's not as conscious as all that. Likely these soldiers didn't even consider what their acts meant for gender boundaries. And see, that's what makes it so insidious. You don't even realize that you're doing it when you do it. You may not stop to think how it might make someone else feel for you to put on the opposite gender's clothing just for fun. And if you think of it at all, you might say, bah, they're just a minority, no need to worry about them. Or yeah, but no one here is like that. But you don't know. And there was that one photograph after all of the male dance partner who looks like they might not have been male after all. What you might intend as just fun might be for the person next to you a message of rigid gender boundaries and condemnation. I'm sorry to say it, but I suspect most of the soldiers in Daman's photographs here probably show this kind of situation more than anything else. Far from compassionate acceptance, I think most of these photographs probably display a callous insensitivity. And seen in this light, the photographs appear very different. At first glance, we're tempted to identify with the apparent bravery of those in drag. But on closer inspection, it might actually be those in regulation uniform desperately trying to blend in who might deserve our attention most. 
it's really impossible to say in the end who was who and what their intentions were here. But of all the possibilities discussed, from theater to disguise to identity to mockery, I think most of them are probably mockery, but in some of them, it might be more. And indeed, some may even be all of the above. That's just how layered and complex gender performance can be. That's what I take away from this. And that says something about how we might choose to look at gender in our world today. Things are much more open now than they were in the Third Reich. A lot more open. And gender boundaries are far less rigid. Cross-dressing and gender bending might be an expression of who you are today. It might be a statement of solidarity with such people. And it might even just be an exploration of the new possibilities available in these kinds of times. Like, heck yeah, gender fluidity, rock on. But it can also reinforce gender rigidity if the game of dress-up becomes a mockery. So it's important for us to stay on our toes, even today, and pay attention to what's really going on, whether we're talking about a photograph from World War II or your average party today. It's worth considering, because I do remember more rigid times, and I'm not so fooled to think that such times could never come again. Well, that's all I've got for you today on this topic. Thanks for listening, folks. I hope you learned something today. I know I did. If you want to check out the book I was mentioning, it's called Soldier Studies, Cross-Dressing in Der Wehrmacht by Martin Daman. We will post some of the photographs from the book in the episode post on our website as well at www.historyofsexpod.com. Next week, we will wrap up our super deep dive series, Sex in the Third Reich, and that will also conclude the first season of this show. After that, we'll be taking a hiatus to research and recharge, and then hopefully we'll be back with more great history. There's a lot more that you almost never get to hear about from all different cultures all over the world, and this show's mission is to bring that to you. If you like what we're doing here on this show, you can subscribe, rate, and review or pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait drawn in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you as an actor in Shakespeare's theater, gloriously reveling in the ambiguity of the stage, or whatever you want. I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash b-t-n-e-w-b-e-r-g. All right, we'll see you next week. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.